In New Jersey, there's a law that says three strikes and you're out. In other words, if you commit usually a felony three times, you'll never be released from jail. You become an enemy of the state, unforgiven as it were. I think Jeroboam's greatest challenge was loving the world and also trying to love God. Now, obviously that's not unique to Jehoshaphat. It was a problem in the first century. It's a problem today. It's a problem with me. James sums it up. And I really like how the Amplified emphasizes this verse. James 4, verse 4. You are like unfaithful wives, having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy to God. Jehoshaphat had more than three strikes, but I listed these three because these were the most consequential of his kingdom. He was risking always unfaithfulness to God by trying to join to a failed kingdom in Israel that was worse than the kingdoms in the world. He he failed with an alliance with Ahab, who we're going to look at next class. He failed with an alliance with Ahaziah, Ahab's son. And then for the third time, he fails again trying to make an alliance with Jehoram, Ahab's other son. And all these alliances tend to be similar. And what I find true with me, maybe you'll find it yourself, is usually it's the same sin that keeps tripping me up. And this desire Ahab, or this desire that Jehoshaphat had to make alliances with Ahab, Jehoram, Ahaziah, it tripped him up so bad that it almost risked losing the kingdom and the line through to Jesus. But you know what? Here's where Jehoshaphat's different. After every failure, he turns back to God, and then he tries to undo the mistake he made and strengthen the people. He tries to undo the evil that he caused. The the simple lesson is Jehoshaphat never gave up on God. You know, Jehoshaphat makes one last sin where the royal line was almost wiped out. It was extinguished except for one child that was preserved. When we make mistakes, brothers and sisters, if at least if you're like me, you try to rationalize them. We never own up to our own shortcomings. And because of that, we never really learn from our mistakes. I have, honestly, I can tell you, I've learned more from my mistakes than I have from everything else. And your mistakes will sting, they hurt, they cause trouble. But own up to it, learn from it, and like Jehoshaphat, move on. Now, with all these mistakes, all these failed joinings, as James put it, illicit love affairs he attempted with the northern tribes, he could have reasoned it this way. Well, if we have stronger ties to the northern tribes, we'll be safer. Maybe we'll bring them back to God. He might have thought, well, we have common enemies. We're better off together. He might have thought we'd be better off having them as friends than turning them into enemies. And so he kept justifying it. But Israel was worse than the world 
and he kept trying to make a marriage alliance to it. It was tragic. And always with Jehoshaphat, you'll see there's always that element of compromise. And we'll see that when we talk about Ahab a little bit. And we saw with Jeroboam, where he compromised the principles of the truth, watered down the law. And that's when apostasy sets in. Now let's look at Jehoshaphat's commitment. You tell me what's missing. And these are excerpts from his three alliances. Ahab, the king of Israel, said, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he said, I am as you are. My people is your people. We will be with you in war. Second Chronicles 8.3. So that's with Ahab. Listen to the language with Jehoram. And he sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has got free from my authority. Will you go with me to make war on Moab? And he said, I will go with you. I am as you are. My people as your people. My horses as your horses. And it always made me think of Ruth when I read that, where Ruth to Naomi says, I will take, or your people will be my people, your God, my God. And Ruth leaves everything behind to join Naomi. This time in a good way. Jeph Jehoshaphat almost left everything behind in the wrong way. He almost lost it all. And what's missing in these exchanges, just like we talked about with Jehoshaphat, is God. He doesn't consult with God. And when he does, he rolls right over it. To be honest, I can actually relate a lot to Jehoshaphat. It's so easy to get entangled with the world. You know, you know, with addicts, a lot of times they will set them aside in a place that's separated from all their temptations and they'll work with them and make them stronger and then let them back into the world stronger and able to deal with it. Well, I think for the past 15 months, we've been cordoned off from the world and we're just about ready to get back into it. The world is opening up. It's calling for us. Are we going to get entangled in it again? We've had a respite. Are we going to waste it? Sometimes, at least myself, and you see it with Jehoshaphat, you try really hard to keep both feet in both worlds. And it's always to our ruin. We sacrifice Bible classes or Sunday schools or other things to do sports with our kids or, you know, there's just so many things in the world. And I know in my own life, that still bothers me that the time I spend on useless things of the world where I could have spent my time with my children uh, much better off. But, but we all have our own things, our own entanglements. And, and now especially, we don't want to get back into the world. If you think about that passage from James, let's put it back up. There we go, sorry, technical difficulties here. Right now, May 29th, 2021, are you taking your stand against God with the world? Or are you taking your stand with God? We don't want to get involved with the world. We've, we've gone cold turkey, as it were. And we don't want to become an enemy of God by being joined to the world. You know, when Jehoshaphat stood with, and, and look at this company, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, every time Jehoshaphat stood with the world, he almost lost his life. Every time he stood with the world, he almost died. He was always afraid. How much worse off are we if we take a stand against God 
our Father who holds our breath in his hands. Joining the world, says James, makes us the Lord's enemies. And I thought that was just kind of appropriate at this moment in time after this pandemic to think about what we're getting back into. In 2 Chronicles 18, 1 to 3, and I'll read it for you. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people and, he had, and the people he had with him. And he persuaded him to go to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. We will be with thee in war. Spiritually, that war was against the father, and I don't think he realized that. And I think from my perspective, there's something hidden in this verse. And this was probably one of the worst mistakes Jehoshaphat made. It says he made affinity with Ahab. And that word affinity means to become son-in-law, to make oneself a daughter's husband. It has the idea of a wife's father, a wife's mother, father-in-law, mother-in-law, to make oneself a daughter's husband. And what I'm driving at is when Jehoshaphat went to Ahab, I believe that's when he promised his son in marriage to Athaliah. And that would be the worst mistake he could possibly make. And it may have happened on this very occasion. This was the illicit love affair that James speaks of, where Jehoshaphat chooses Ahab over the father. He broke his marriage vows to the Lord. He formed a marriage alliance with Ahab. And again, what if Jehoshaphat had only asked the father first? We know he would never have been there with Ahab. He never would have married his son, Athaliah. And think of the consequences. Because of that mistake, all of his sons but one would die. All of his grandsons would die because he made affinity with the world. He married it. And what we see from the example that our brother read for us was he decided first, and then he asked God, and then he ignores the answer God provided through Micaiah the prophet. And I think this is really worth thinking about. And it's a problem with every king, starting with Saul. How do you make decisions? Do you put it to God first? Do you pray about it? Not just a quick prayer when you're off to do it, but do you think about it ahead of time? Do you put it to prayer? Do you reason through with your spouse or your children? Is this really the wisest thing? Do you put a spiritual magnifying glass on the issue? What principles are your decisions based on? You know, in the first class, and we didn't get to it, but there's an idea of thinking about what you're thinking about. And that's always being aware of your thoughts. In that class, it was when you realize you're sinning to capture yourself then and to cut it off, you know, as you wish, or, or man's thoughts were evilly continued. Whatever it is you use to interrupt that thought process so you don't follow through. But we also make decisions and we tend not to think about them, at least myself, as much as we should. You know, in the old days, and I'm, I'm showing my age here with this one, but it was very common for brothers to go around and say, if the Lord will. It was always in prayers, I heard. They would always put it to the Lord first. 
And there's a lot of wisdom behind this. God can't be an afterthought. He can't be thought of after we've made the decision. And I just want to have a quick digression here. Because you think about the situation. Imagine yourself with Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Micaiah is brought forward. And then imagine yourself, Micaiah. Micaiah said, if you return at all in peace, Yahweh has not spoken by me. And then he goes, listen, you people, all of you. So he draws attention to God's word. But Mikey, I already knew that what he said wasn't going to be accepted. It, it seems like he may have been pulled out of prison and he was going to be sent back to prison. But he still delivers a message that he knows he's going to suffer because of. And when he returns to prison, he's even worse off. And I think what the worst thing would have been that day for poor Mikey Aya is seeing righteous King Jehoshaphat ignore the word of the Lord and walk over it. More than anything, he suffered to see that good king turn his back on the Lord would have been devastating. And you know, brothers and sisters, here's the irony. Jehoshaphat didn't believe Micaiah, or at least he didn't let on that he understood it. But Ahab did. Ahab knew enough to disguise himself. He didn't want to stand up as the king of Israel. And so he goes to battle in disguise. And the point of this little tiny digression is sometimes serving God it's just not easy. You know, we got to remember that our reward is not in this life. When you're going through a tough time, either in your family or your ecclesia, you think about Mikey Aya and what by extension James said he did that day. He took his stand with God. And let those words be said of us. Mikey really is the only bright spot in this whole sad episode. And you know, sometimes serving God, you literally are standing alone. You're choosing not to follow the crowd. And what makes it tougher is, is when that crowd might be your brothers and sisters. But Mikey took his stand with the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 18, 27, and I'll just read this to you. 2 Chronicles 18, 27. And Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all ye people of Israel. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat is literally brushing aside the word of the Lord. And God still forgave him. As, as abrupt and as rude as Jehoshaphat was to God's servant, God heard him and forgave him. And, you know, even more important than that, and this is really the essential piece, Jehoshaphat believed that God could forgive him and could save him. The one is already a given. We know God can save and forgive. As, as one brother said, that's what God's good at is forgiving us, saving us. But for us to believe it is another thing. Never underestimate the mercy of God. Well, what about us? Think about the answer you had to the last class, the Jeroboam test. Are you going to be in the kingdom or not? If God is truly all powerful, he must be powerful enough to forgive us and save us. 
if you listen to that good Christadelphian talk I mentioned earlier, Brother Harry keeps alluding to this point. He is able to save us. Jehoshaphat believed it, and we need to believe that too. Jehoshaphat was in the worst predicament, always ready to lose his life, and the father saves him. In 2 Chronicles 18.31, and I have it on the screen in front of you, and it came to pass when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat that they said, it is the king of Israel. Therefore, they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out and the Lord helped him and God moved them to depart from him. He was as good as dead, but he knew he could cry to the Lord and he was saved. That word helped means to protect, to aid, to surround. It has the idea of building a wall around him. In Psalm 119, verse 11, it's the top of your screen. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That really was the key. That was his secret. In his heart was a stockpile of spiritual guidance. And it was there to draw upon. That's one of the reasons you do your readings is to make that stockpile full. And he drew upon it when he needed it most. In 2 Chronicles 17, verse 4, it says, but, but he sought the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. And even more important, verse 6, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord, Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. And finally, same chapter, 2 Chronicles 19, verses 9 and 10. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. And they went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah. So they made no war against Jehoshaphat. And, and what this is, is after he failed, after he made a mistake, he goes back to Israel. He basically does for them what he had done for himself. He strengthens them in the Lord. He builds them up with God's word. And the result was the fear of the Lord filled those around You know, oops. I'm going to skip ahead a slide. You can always come back to God. The door is always open. You know, I remember, I think it was Brother Harry Tennant again. Sorry, I'm quoting him a bit. But I think Brother Harry said in a meeting that we had here in Bucks County, very close to where I'm at, he said, arranging boards need to realize this. And what he meant and what he was referring to is arranging boards don't forgive sins. When somebody wants to come back, like the prodigal, they need to be welcomed back. They've made their wrong alliances. They've admitted it. The door needs to be open for those who have gone out into the world. The light is always on. And I think what helped Jehoshaphat was he remembered things from his father, his father Asa, the good lessons that Asa had taught him. In 2 Chronicles 15, 3 and 4, Now for a long season, Israel hath been without a true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And Jehoshaphat remembered that. He remembered when his father made mistakes and turned to the Lord 
the Lord was there. And then read on the column on the right. It, it's 2 Chronicles 17, 3 and 4. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David. He sought not unto Balaam, but he sought to the Lord God of his father, that's Asa. And he walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. And I think the key here is he went early. He went in the early ways of Asa, his father. He turned to God. He learned and kept the laws again. And Jehoshaphat followed Asa's example. He patterned himself after his dad. And it's a whole class there, but parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, what are you teaching your young people, your children, your grandbabies? Are they hearing about God's law and love and mercy are they hearing spiritual things? It certainly made an effect on Jehoshaphat, as it will in your family. We need to be teaching our children and grandchildren, those young people in our ecclesia, to put God before them. Now, Jehoshaphat's greatest challenge was this. It's 2 Chronicles verse 20. This wasn't one of his three strikes. This was near the end of his life. And everything kind of comes to a culmination here. Second Chronicles 20, we're starting with verse 1. Now after this, the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, with some of the Mayanites, made war against Jehoshaphat. And they came to Jehoshaphat with news saying, a great army is moving against you from Edom across the sea. And now they are in Hazion Tamar, which is in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat, in his fear, went to the Lord for directions and gave orders to all throughout Judah for the people to go without food. Boy, if only every king had done that. In his fear, he went to the Lord, and they fasted, and they prayed, and the Lord delivered Judah from this terrible enemy. And, and there's another verse that, that really is nice to build on this. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. And just imagine this being in your heart when you're in trouble. Oh, our God, will you not be their judge? For our strength is not equal to this great army, which is coming against us. And we are at a loss what to do. But our eyes are on you. Boy, if Jeroboam had remembered that, or Rehoboam, or Saul, what a different kingdom we would be dealing with. And God answers in verse 17. There'll be no need for you to take up arms in this fight. Put yourselves in position. Keep where you are, and you will see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, have no fear, and do not be troubled. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. And I just want to stop right here, because I want to talk about that word fear. The word fear means dreadful, just kind of like we thought about it. And it's the same word used by Malachi in chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, what Jehoshaphat went through, we're going to go through. One day we will be filled with fear for what's happening in this world. Think of Jehoshaphat. Our eyes are upon you. And we know this is going to happen. Daniel 12, verse 1. There will be a time of trouble such as never was from the time there was a nation 
even to the same time. And at that time, your people will be kept safe. Everyone recorded in the book. Daniel 12, verse 1. As kings, as leaders preparing for the kingdom, remember Jehoshaphat. Remember this lesson. If you think about the world right now, do you really see a whole lot of good news in the future? It scares me to say that your children and grandchildren may refer to this state as the good old days. There are so many problems in so many different areas of this planet, a time of trouble. We need this lesson, but we need to instill it in our children and our grandchildren. We're facing a terrible situation with no way out unless our eyes are upon the Lord. And if we follow Jehoshaphat's example, we will get through. We will be saved. We will not lose hope. God will save us. Jehoshaphat proved God. He believed. He sought God. He fasted. He prayed. He praised. And he was preserved. I think what's kind of interesting with this example was there they are standing, facing the army coming towards them, no weapons in their hand, and they start singing. And as soon as they start praising the Lord, that was the switch. They set their their eyes and their mouth and their minds upon the Lord. And when it was obvious, when it came out, their enemies were destroyed and driven from them. What a great lesson for us to remember for the times that are coming. You know, when you talk about Jehoshaphat, and this is actually something worth writing down in your margin, there's one phrase that's uniquely associated with Jehoshaphat. And we saw it here in 2 Chronicles 17, 6. His heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Now, if you open your concordance, you will see that idea of being lifted up is always used negatively. It's always used of pride. It's always used of describing the flesh. Always negative. But with Jehoshaphat, it wasn't pride. What he was lifting up was his God. He was exalting God in his heart. And if you think of that example from last class where God keeps us unfallen, God pushes us up away from the the death in that salt lake, in the Dead Sea. Just as God lifts us up, we lift up God in our hearts. Now, that word lifted up also means exalted. And in Job 36, verse 7 on your screen, here's where it brings it all back to us, brothers and sisters, future leaders in the kingdom. Job 36, verse 7, the exact same word, he withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever. They are exalted, lifted up. This is what God will do for his leaders, his kings in the kingdom. will lift them up. In Job 36, 5 through 7, I just want to read the beginning part of that because it's even better. Truly God gives up the hard-hearted and will not give life to the sinner. His eyes are ever on the upright. He gives to the crushed their right, lifting them up to the seat of kings and making them safe forever. That's such an extraordinary verse. 
especially when we think of it in relation to Jehoshaphat. The word safe forever, or verse 7, exalted, is the same word lifted up. So future kings, exalt God in your heart. It also says he crushed. It's not on the slide, but it was in Job 36, verse 5. He crushed his hard heart. That's what you need to do to lift up God. Jehoshaphat crushed the hardness of his heart, as Job alluded to. He humbled himself. He exalted the Father and not himself. Thy will, not mine, be done. And when we do that, God elevates us to kingship forever. 2 Peter 2, verse 9, on the right hand, it says, But you are a chosen race, a priesthood of kingly lineage, a holy nation, a people belonging specially to God, that you may make known the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's what we're to do, to make known the perfections of the Lord, as we alluded to earlier in our previous class. Crushing our heart, humbling ourselves, is when God can finally lift us up and exalt us. And to go full circle in this thought, are we taking a stand with God or men? In Romans 8, verse 6, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The world's coming back. We can't rejoin ourselves to the things of the world when we leave. Now, there's an idea hidden in the Hebrew that I think is useful, useful to think about for Jehoshaphat. And, and again, it's one of those things. And, and here it is on the slide. And it's a golden thread. And I think Brother Harry also said, whenever you see a thread in scriptures, pull it and see what comes out. And, and here's a thread related to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat 19.3. It says, and thou hast prepared... In other words, stand upright thine heart to seek the Lord. Second Chronicles 20, 32, and I'm just going to pick out part of the verse. That which was right, upright, straight, level. That's what that word right means, in the sight of the Lord. So there's this idea of Jehoshaphat always standing upright. And finally, in Second Chronicles 20, 20, the word believe, where it says, Believe in the Lord your God. And that word believe means support for pillars or doors, something upright, perpendicular. And he ends, so shall ye prosper. We need to trust and believe in our foundation, who is God. And if we do, God will keep us upright, straight, perpendicular. We're either for God or we're not. Now, consider what God said about Manasseh, who we're going to look at tomorrow. Manasseh made Jerusalem as crooked as Ahab's house. And it's in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 21, 13. 2 Kings 21, 13. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. God had, as it were, a plumber's plum, or my grandfather used to call it a plumb bob, but it was a brass weight with an arrow at the bottom and it hung by a string. And when you unrolled it, I forgot to bring one today. It always points up and down. It's, it's the least sophisticated of all tools. 
But by comparing yourself to this plum bob or this plum holding the string, you always know if you're perpendicular, if you're straight or you're crooked. And Ahab or Manasseh certainly was crooked. He never compared himself against the Lord and his house. He never made an effort to be straight like Jeroboam, like Jeroboam or Jehoshaphat. In Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, and in the break we were talking about this chapter, Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12 and also Hebrews 11 emphasizes the word seeing, looking. And it comes out, and, and you read that especially it's true in Hebrews 11, if you were to underline it. But in Hebrews 11 and 12, the idea of looking and seeing something is very important. And let me give you an example, because it's helpful to us. In, in my backyard, there's a huge electrical tower. And on that tower, there's usually a hawk. It just seems to attract them. And we're out in the back on the patio looking. And if you suddenly see that hawk fix its gaze downwards, you know it's not going to be a good day for something. Once that hawk is locked in on its target, its prey, nothing distracts it. And that word looking in verse 2 of Hebrews 12 is used only once in Scripture. Remember when I said first time things are used are really important? This particular word looking in verse 2 is only used once in Scripture. And it means to turn the eyes away from other things and to fix them on something. Think of the hawk. And what are we looking for? The coming kingdom. Looking for our Lord Jesus Christ. Having our eyes locked on. And by implication, it means not allowing anything to be a distraction to what you're gazing on, to what you're looking at. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, we read, O oh, our God, and we read this earlier, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. And then you think about it, the reverse is true. In Job 36, 6, his eyes are ever on the upright. It's like looking across the room and catching the gaze of someone. But it's not a someone. It's your father in heaven. When Jehoshaphat and the people are in dire straits, they focused on God. With that hawk-like locking in, nothing could distract them. And they were preserved. In Jude, I don't think I have it. In Jude verse 1, I'll read it for you. Jude, the very first verse. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and are called. And that word preserved means to keep guard, to keep your eyes upon. 
Now, I think it would be wrong for Jude for us to suggest that Jude was thinking of Jehoshaphat, although that's exactly what Jehoshaphat did. But I think what Jude really was thinking when he wrote this word of us being preserved is, I think Jude was thinking of us. Saul always had trouble with this. He doubted God. But Jehoshaphat learns from it. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But I really like the way Weymouth translates it because it's truer to the original. I will never, never let go your hand. I will never, never forsake you. That's the attitude we need, brothers and sisters, that we're locked in on the Lord. He's locked in on us. And we're actually, as it were, holding hands, not releasing our grip. I will never, never let go your hand. Don't doubt that you're going to be in the kingdom. Keep trying. Let that be your focus. Now, one more comment on this, and that's true to the original, how Weymouth rendered that. We know what it means when God repeats something, right? When, when Joseph said the dream's been doubled for a certainty, look at the certainty we have. Brothers and sisters, God has tell, told you, I will never, never let go your hand. He emphasizes it twice. How can we doubt him? You know, these are all empty words if we don't believe it because we are going to face tougher times than we had now. I really think they're started already. Jehoshaphat does some pretty foolish things, but he always turns to God and he's always saved because of that. Philippians 3, 13, it kind of gives us advice on how we should live, how Jehoshaphat lived. I do not say that I have already run, won the race or I have already reached perfection, but I am pressing on, striving to lay hold of the prize for which also Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not imagine that I have yet laid hold on it, but this one thing I do, forgetting everything past and stretching forward to what lies in front of me with my eyes fixed on the goal. I push on to secure the prize of God's heavenward call in Christ Jesus. So as Jehoshaphat fixed his attention and gaze on the Lord, trusted in the Lord, we are to follow that example. There's a phrase used in scripture. And it always struck me as funny. Just, just kind of a strange thing to be recorded. Uh, and I'll read it to you. The phrase is, be of good cheer. And Jesus uses this phrase five times. And it always sounds funny. When the palsied man was let down from the roof and placed in front of the Lord, Jesus says, be of good cheer. And it always struck me as kind of funny. It's almost like it seems like you say, oh, come on, look at the bright side. And that just never quite sat right with me. Or when his disciples are on the boat in fear for their life, Jesus walking on water, be of good cheer. It just doesn't sound appropriate, right? Or, or the woman who had that desperate issue of blood, he looks at her and says, be of good cheer. That almost sounds hollow, doesn't it? Or the disciples in the upper room, just before they lose their master, they're frightened. 
be of good cheer. In fact, it's not a unique phrase to Jesus. It's also used by Paul. Paul's on a sinking ship, and we just read this. And he says to his crewmates, be of good cheer. Not a hair of your head will perish. What it really means, and I didn't understand this till I read something Brother Dennis Gallette had wrote, and then I actually looked it up. It means be of good courage. Don't give up. Look ahead. Imagine yourself being healed is what he's saying. You will be. Be of good courage. Don't give up. All is not lost. We're never alone. We have the Father with us. And there's one last thing to think of as we start to wrap this up. Jesus did everything in his power to save you. He died to save you. When we have self-doubts, when we think we're not good enough, we don't deserve it, we can't be forgiven, when you start feeling that way, and, and try to remember this, think of Jesus. You were his motivation to endure the crucifixion. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, we read this. And here's that word looking. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Do you ever think what the joy was? He was looking ahead. He knew what he faced. But in that picture in his mind, he looked past the cross and something gave him joy. Look at Jude 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, I read that too fast. You think about what Jude is telling us his brother will do. One day, brothers and sisters, Jesus is going to take you by the hand to meet his father. And you will be standing straight and upright, sinless, clothed in white, righteous. And what allowed Jesus to endure was presenting you to his Father with exceeding joy. Saving you is what got Jesus through the cross. Think about that when you're tempted and when you're tried. To me, that's the only verse that makes sense when you talk about the joy before him. Other versions translate it, exceeding joy, great joy, exultant joy. And that joy will come as he walks you to the presence of his father. And then think of Jehoshaphat. Like Jehoshaphat, brothers and sisters, let's exalt ourselves in the Lord. Lift him up in your heart. Honor him with your actions. Because of his great love, his desire to save you through his only son. And nothing else should motivate us more than that.